Hello, and welcome to Sobercast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting Sobercast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. Hi, guys. My name's Angus. I'm an alcoholic. Lovely to see some of you. Good to be in a meeting. It's always good to be in a meeting. I'm safe when I'm in a meeting. And uh, I've been doing this for a long time. You know, I haven't had a drink in 22 years. I got my token last week. I went to a little meeting here in Benidorm, and I was given my token, which means a lot to me. Nice to, uh, it went around the room and everybody rubbed it for luck, you know, and they gave it to me. It was a bit of a surprise. I didn't think that they would um, have one there 22 years. And, uh, yeah, felt nice getting that. I came into this fellowship on the 28th of November 2000, and I haven't had a drink since my first meeting. I was uh, really ready for this. I call it the Goldilocks effect. You have a thing in England, you know, it's about a girl, Goldilocks and the three bears. And this girl goes and um, finds this house and she checks out the beds and she checks out the food and she checks out different things. And one's like, some's no good and some's too much. And But in the middle, it's just right. And they call it the Goldilocks effect. And, um, you know, I used to say that when I came to AA, I was just right for this fellowship, you know. I didn't need convincing. All I needed really was showing what to do. So um, I come out of Brighton in England, uh, youngest of nine. I'm the youngest child of nine of a big Irish Catholic family. My father was a powerful man, very domineering and um, very violent man, done a lot of prison time and a big drinker, feared in the town. And, um, And all my family kind of, you know, followed in his footsteps. And so you know, I had four older brothers and four older sisters, and uh, almost it was like having four mothers and four fathers, really, rather than brothers and sisters, because there was a bit of an age gap. And so I grew up um, alone in a big crowd, a big family, but I felt quite alone, you know. And I went to school like you do, and I, I left school with no education, no qualifications, and um, I believe I was emotionally disturbed as a child. And I think I come from a dysfunctional family and I grew up on a very poor estate, the council estate. And um, it was all sort of hand to mouth, you know, and there was no morals or principles. Anything went and everything went really. Oh, uh, first recollection was shoplifting and glue sniffing and things like that as a kid. And then drink, you know, at a young age, 13, maybe 12, 13, 14, around that age, taking alcohol. And I believe alcohol had a grip of me before I um, embarked into anything to do with life. So it was like, I was like a marionette and alcohol was pulling the strings of this puppet, which was Angus, you know, it was, it was, I was crashing into everything through my life because I had a drink in my system. Relationships, you know, they say you can't have a relationship with a woman and a bottle. The bottle will win every time. And it did. I had a lot of failed relationships, careers, missed days at work, you know, by, by drinking the night before promised myself I'd go early I'd leave early and get up for work you know but the times I slept in and didn't get up you know so that cost me uh, a a few career opportunities so I was probably heading to a miserable end really like a lot of alcoholics that are active do and I um I suffered consequences like I said there were no morals or principles in the area I grew up in and committing crimes was was just fun in fact, it was only it was only ever a crime if you got caught, if you got away with anything. It was a laugh and something to talk, you know, to to sort of joke about and brag about, you know, around the streets and in the pubs. I worked in the building trades. I was a painter and decorator. I was I worked. I'd done different trades in the building industry, you know, plasterer, painter and decorator, suspended ceiling specialist. I'd done that for a while. Um, I'd done lots of different trades and uh, was in and out of work all through my drinking career and in and out of relationships. Never had any children. I could never sort of sustain a relationship long enough to be, you know, to get married and have children. It never happened for me. So uh, I drank and drifted in and out of relationships. Drugs were a part of my story as well. You know, drugs were a consequence of my drinking because I was out drinking. 
it was around the 80s, the end of the 80s, 88 and 89, when all the acid house parties started. And I just left a three-year relationship, which broke my heart, but I didn't know how to deal with that. I never spoke to anyone about it. I just carried on, went to the pub, but without my partner. And I was lost. Again, back to that lonely boy. And I drifted around and I hung out with the wrong kind of people. Funny, isn't it? We say we meet unsavory characters, you know, but hey, guess who was there? Me. Maybe, you know, it might be an idea for me to look at myself in some of them situations. And that's a big chunk of truth to digest, you know. But, um, yeah, so we'd split up this relationship and I was sort of drifting around the pubs and clubs in Brighton and home. And I knew a few of the guys and the lads of the street, you know, the knocker boys and the drug dealers and the football violence boys and all that, you know, because my family had a bit of a reputation and I was well known. And Angus is a name that stands out a little bit as well, strangely enough, you know. I was quite quite a, a memorable character. I, I was a very out there drinker. I love parties. I love dancing. I love people. I'm a very colourful character. Um, and I was introduced to Speed, uh, uh, an after party. And I took that and I was up for the whole weekend, marching around Brighton and Ove. Met a couple of girls and ended up having a bit of time with them at the end of the weekend. And then I was drinking and drinking and you know, carrying on in, in the club scene. And then I started dealing speed as well, getting it and selling it and to just to fund my drinking so I could be out, you know, because I didn't have a life. You know, drinking had stopped me building up any kind of a life. So I didn't really have one. So I wanted to be out of it. You know, the life I had wasn't wanting, I didn't want to be in it. I wanted to be out of it. And so I wanted to be drunk and drugged and sort of living in a fantasy world. But the trouble is that started adding up. The day started adding up together and together, you know, and, and it became a constant. So the normality of life, if you call it that, living at home with my mum and brother and elderly nan, I didn't want to be there. I wanted to be down the town. So I was living like two worlds, you know. And that went on for a while, but um, because of the characters I was hanging around with, I was starting to commit crimes and things, you know, and the one guy I met was a bit lively, you know, and he came to my house one night with a replica gun in his hand. I thought nothing of it. We went out for a few beers, ended up by a petrol station. He, he said, why don't we rob that petrol station? I went, yeah, go on then, just for the fun of it. Over we went, kicked in the door, put the gun in the guy's head, robbed the till, ran up ran over the footbridge at Hove Station, for those who know the area, and, and um, I threw up with all the nervousness of what we'd just done, and then I ran up the road with him into a, an unmarked police car coming down the road, and the guy stopped, he ran down his window, and he said, can, he have, a, could it, he said, can I have a word, lads? And my mate just ran into the football, we were behind a football pitch, there was a Brighton football game going on, he ran and jumped into there and disappeared into the night, you know, and I ran up the road into another car, police car, and they jumped out and grabbed me and I was arrested. I was taken to the cells, I'd done an ID parade, I didn't get charged, well I got bailed. Um, pending forensic evidence and uh, the forensic evidence came back nine months later and they charged me with uh, armed robbery with violence um, and it took two years in total for that to go to court and it went to court and rightly so I got found guilty and they sentenced me to six years in prison so there you go you know running the gauntlet with drink and just misbehaving and not really being careless and carefree, having no structure in my life, taking drink and drugs, party drugs, um, and drinking copious amounts of drink, you know, and ending up in a situation like that, you know, and there I'll find myself getting taken off to Lewis prison and then off to Coldingley prison, which was a category A stroke B prison, long term as four years and over. And I've done a few years of that six years in there. Um, funny enough, when, it, when I was in a controlled environment, I, I flowered. You know, I learned the guitar. I became a gym instructor, a gym orderly. I was a charge hand engraver. I was the store man in the prison. You know, I was, and I made hooch in the in the nick. We used to make the drink. You know, making hooch. And uh, in the in the in the prison I was in, if you made it and got away with making it, because it used to take a few days to ferment. You know, the yeast and everything and the sugar. If you got away with it, they let you drink it because they didn't want any trouble, you know, the screws. So we'd have parties on the wing. But if you got caught making it, you'd lose time. But luckily, I never got caught. 
And one week I put a sheet up along the end of the spur and I wrote on it, private party, keep out. And the screws came up. They said, you can't write that. You can't hide behind a sheet, you know, in the wing with the guys. And they could murder someone in there. So I had to take the sheet down, but they let us carry on drinking. Crazy when you think about it. Anyway, I quite, in I quite enjoyed my time in prison. And when I say that, because I got fit and strong, you know, and, uh, and luckily I didn't lose anyone outside. You know, nobody died outside, like a parent or a loved one. Well, and I did. I went in without a relationship, so I had nothing to break my heart when I was in there. I did meet a guy who was coming into the prison, being relocated, and I said, "Where have you been?" He said, "I've been into Wandsworth, which is a really rough prison." I said, um, "Why are you coming back?" He said, "Oh, I was here before, but I freaked out." He said, "I had a visit off my mum and my girl, my mum and my wife." And they drove home and crashed the car and they both died, he said. And I got told that and I freaked out in my cell and they carted me off to a harder prison. And um, so anyway, that's the kind of consequences I heard stories of, you know, some terrible things that go on. But I didn't lose anyone or have any bad time in prison. So my journey wasn't too bad. I came out of that sentence um, again, never stopped me drinking. And I got involved in working with a family member doing suspended ceilings and refurbishments and things. And I drank and drank and drank, you know, pubs and clubs again. And then it was cocaine. It escalated then, you know, I was getting into my, what was I then? I suppose mid-20s, late 20s. And then I was earning a bit more. And then the cocaine added to the drink and the pub scene again and the club scene. And I was just drifting along, you know. But what actually happened for me was, um, there, was a, there was a tragedy in my family. And like I told you, I came from a big family. And one of my sisters had three daughters. And one night, two of them were out down the town, living the same life. They were party girls, so they were living the same life we'd all been living, you know, pubs and clubs and drinking and partying. And um, they rang their mother and said, Mum, can you pay the taxi? We have, we've run out of money. She went, yeah, no problem. Anyway, early hours of the next morning, the police knocked on my sister's door and started describing the two girls. And they said... Uh, has this, you know, have you got two daughters? She went, yeah. And they said, long blonde hair, freckles on her arms, tattoos. And as my sister's nodding, she's realising she's she's identifying these two girls, and this isn't good. And they said, um, we're really sorry to tell you, there's been a road accident last night, and these two girls were found dead at the scene. So my sister had lost her two daughters who were out partying and drinking, following the same line that we'd all been doing. But they didn't survive it. They died. And one left four babies, the eldest of the two sisters, and left four children. My great grand, my, you know, I'm a great uncle to them. Um, and, the, and the father brings them up today. In fact, they've gone on to have children because 22 years have gone by, as I said at the beginning. And so that was a horrific time, you know. And at that time, I moved into my sisters to help her come to terms with the grief. Imagine I moved in there, you know, and we just drank and we partied, and it was a red light zone for the police, you know. If you get called to go to that address, be anything could happen up there. And there could be murders up there or there could be anything. Because them guys are crazy. You know, they're off their heads. They're trying to, they're drinking to deal with grief, which is the last thing you want to be doing. And it was a nasty household with violence and drinking and drugging. Um, escalating with me, uh, losing my head one night and attacking my sister's boyfriend. And I had to leave the house. A violent episode. Um, happened and I had to leave the house and I I went off and lived with another brother of mine who was an alcoholic today he sits in a nursing home with alcoholic dementia and he rocks in the chair he's 10 years older than me and he's never coming out of that home he's gone you know his head's gone he's got what you call a wet brain but I moved in with him and uh, his girlfriend for a period of time and then I found myself a little bed sit and that was the first time I got away from the family from the clubs, the pubs, the, the people I knew. And I sat with myself in this bedsit. It was £60 a week, a little working bedsit, HMO they call them, home of multiple occupancy. And I had the top room, a little, I used to call it a little hobbit's hole, like a little, you know, little, little hovel up the top in this apex of the, of the roof. And I lived up there, you know, and, um, and I, I was hanging on to the coattails of a job laboring for a friend of mine and um that's where i found aa he said to me this guy i was working with he said angus he said you keep blaming this that and the other for your drinking and your problems in your life he said i've watched you i've known you since you were 14 you know i was about 32 then 
Yeah, I've known you all this time, he said to me, and you're really blaming everyone. He said, you want to, Angus, have you got a mirror indoors? I went, yeah. He said, go and have a look in it. It's where all your problems are coming from. It's you. I wanted to hit him. I thought, how dare you tell me the truth, you know? But thank God for that bit of tough love, because it made me look at me. And I saw what he saw was that I am an alcoholic. I do have a big problem with the booze. And that I needed to stop and I needed help. And uh, he told me about AA. First time I'd ever heard of it. Amazing, isn't it? All the years of all that misery, drinking and troubles. And I'd never known about AA. He mentioned it to me and I, um, I went down the road one night and I rang up the helpline after him telling me to go a few times. And I, uh, I walked along the road that night and I found a meeting. And that was the first meeting I ever went to. And that's, that was the start of my recovery. So I got into AA after, like I like to call it, a catalogue of catastrophes, you know, prisons, problems, failed relationships, lost jobs, upset friends and family. The list is endless. You know, it's miserable drinking. I cannot live and drink. It's miserable. And I'm going to come to a sticky end or someone else's or it's not going to be pretty, you know, because like I said before, I'm a very colourful out there kind of drinker. And I come from a very violent background in my father and in our Irish Catholic blood, blood, bloodline. Anyway, so I know what I'm capable of and I'm scared of that. And that, that, that helps to keep me sober as well today, to be honest with you. But um, I came into AA and I was left alone, which was the best thing could happen to me. I was left alone and left to sit down and never listen and have a cup of tea. And I did that for a few days, you know, and uh, after a weekend, I, I, I went to work on the Monday and I said to my mate, I'm never drinking again, Andy. I'm an alcoholic. He said, I've been telling you that for weeks. I said, no, but I really, am. I said, he said, I know. He said, that's why I told you to go. But it dawned on me, you know, something, the light bulb moment happened. It came on. I'm talking about a weekend. It, you know, I realised what my problem was. Oh, and I looked at all that, you know, cat, catalogue of catastrophes, like I said, the prisons and this, that and the other and all the drugs and all the rest of it. Anyway, so I just kept going to meetings. I went to meetings every day, you know, two times at the weekend, twice on a Saturday and a Sunday. And I went every day, went to work, went home, went to a meeting, went home and went to bed. Got up the next day, went to work, went home, went to a meeting, you know, went home after the meeting and went to bed. And I'd done that for ages and i saw a man in the meetings called huggy mike and i thought this guy he he seems to have the faith of a child he seems to have an innocence about him he really believes in aa and, and he has a faith and a higher power and he's quite a calm guy seems quite co happy the way he's living not drinking and uh, i gravitated towards him and one day I was asked to do a chair and I felt a bit of a fraud going to a meeting to give a talk like I'm doing now without a sponsor. I thought, I don't really feel part of AA. I better ask someone to help me. And Huggy was a greeter at the meeting. So as I walked in, I went, Huggy, I said, uh, I've been thinking of asking you, could you help me with these steps that they talk about? He said, it would be a privilege and an honour. I'd love to help you. I said, thanks, really? He said, yeah. I said, thanks, mate. So I went in. I done the chair and I told everyone I've got a sponsor. I just asked somebody at the door <laughs> and I, in, I went on. Every time I've done chairs, I always tell people what I'm doing about the steps and AA and how I did step one and how I did step two and how I did step three. And I kept on moving forward, you know, trudging means, you know, move forward purposefully. And I, um, I never held back on, and I never stopped. You know, I, I met Huggy regularly. I went to meetings regularly. I worked the steps thoroughly, all 12 of them, from, and I read the book from cover to cover. When I got a copy of that book after the first few weeks, I read it from cover to cover. I kept it simple. I didn't flit about in the book. I wanted, you know, it says in there, it outlines what our problem is, you know, through the doctor's opinion. It talks more about alcoholism. Then it talks about what we do to, to, to have the obsession removed. Well, there's an order to that. And I wanted that order in my life, you know, some sort of discipline, some kind of direction. So I, I read the book from cover to cover, a few lines at night, a few chapter, a few um, paragraphs at night, you know, I dog ear the page and in that little bed sit, I was left alone. So I had my book there, I was on my own, I was single and I had a, an A4 pad in front of me and a pen and I went through the steps and um, it all made sense to me. The obsession left me. I haven't wanted a drink since I found AA. That's the truth. 
And um, I went on in AA to build up a building company. I met a Swedish woman and we got married. Um, I'd never met anyone like her. She was such a clever, lovely woman. She gave me a few good tips. One night I was moaning about a few things and she said, Angus, the best revenge is a good life. Why don't you just go and get a good life? Stop moaning about the past and things that have happened and your hard luck story. The best revenge is a good life. Go and get one. She, she just floored me with that. I thought, Christ, oh my, that just took the anger out of everything. You know, I thought, well, she's got a point. Again, it made me look at me. Like my mate Andy, when he said, have you got a mirror indoors? It made me look at me. And I'd never done that. I'd always been out there looking, you know, through fear and anxiety. I'm always kind of waiting for the next move or watching my back. But this made me stop and look at me, you know, and... Um, she gave me some comfort and we stayed together and we got married and um, I built up a building company and had guys working for me from the fellowship and everything else. And I went on to sponsor guys and I've done that ever since I've been in because the idea of this, get the message and get a life. My brother said it to me, Angus, get the message and get a life. And I went on to do that, you know, and I built up a business and uh, I had 25 men working for me at one time doing very well working for Brighton Council and architects, surveyors and estate agents doing property maintenance. And um, my wife had a very successful job as well. She's a little bit older than me as well, my wife. Never been married, never had any children and never drank. She supported me by never drinking. And that was wonderful. What a woman, you know, to not consider drinking and to do it to support me. Um, and so... We went forward and, and very successfully and everything was great, you know, and uh, um, then Brexit hit and my wife didn't feel so comfortable in England being Swedish and we have a place in Sweden. So she said, do you want to go and live over there? I said, that sounds appealing to me. Why not? You know, and it was almost on the on the, the back of a bit of retirement as well. I went, yeah, sounds great. So I went over there and I um, I started a new life in Sweden. I wrapped up my building company in Hove and Brighton, where I'd done 15, 16 years of recovery, by the way, and know everybody in Hove and Brighton recovery. And everyone knows me, you know, and that's great. Low host of friends and, 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 and pals. Lots of, lots of time there, you know, lots of conventions, lots of AA. Loved it, loved it. Still do, very dear to me, you know, and I do a lot of Zoom meetings in Brighton and Hove now, keeping in touch with all the gang. Um, I went to Sweden. It was a bit sparse on the meeting front. There was one meeting a week in Malmö. So I used a four hour drive to go up there once a week. And there was about three of us there, sometimes two. It was a bit dawdy and I wasn't getting much out of it. And I thought, oh, and I was trying to give and there wasn't much to give. I did end up with a couple of sponsees up there, but I faded away from that meeting a little bit. And I started going to Swedish ones, but I couldn't understand the language. And then I took up the language. I went to school five days a week, three hours a day, and I learned Swedish. And I can speak Swedish now and understand a fair bit of it. So um, to a fair level. And that's brilliant. You know, I'm impressed about that because I left school with no education and no qualification. So to be able to talk another language to me is sort of out there. You know, that's some something else. But I've managed to do it. And um, so I was doing the Swedish meetings, you know, and there's five there's, there on every day in the area I was living in. So that was good. And um yeah, life went along and then the pandemic hit and that was a bit of a shocker, you know, but then the, the meetings I was going to set up, um, we were doing Skype meetings for a while and then that turned to Zoom because of the pandemic and uh, I was involved in the starting of a group called Everlasting Sobriety, which is flying along now, so it's on four nights a week, you know, in the beginning it was just three of us from the Malma meeting. And we had a Skype meeting and uh, we'd do it twice a week. It was once a week. Then it became twice a week. Then it became registered and then it became four nights a week. And then Zoom took over after the pandemic and then it became everlasting sobriety. Um, and it's a big old meeting now, you know, and that's flying along. <clears throat> and uh, yeah, I was, I was glad to be part of the beginning of all of that fumbling our way through Zoom and Skype and then Zoom and how it all started off. And a lot of people got sober on that which is great. And then with the Zoom, obviously it connected me back to Brighton and Hove. So I do the morning meetings now, which is, a, a, for me, it's 10 till 11, which is a great time. But in England, it's nine till 10. Um, and that's a child-friendly morning meeting. And then there's the uh, evening meetings, half seven till nine every night. Again, that's half eight till 10 for me every night if I want them. And I love that. You know, if I'm not doing anything of importance, I'm in a meeting. 
and I love that. And I, I have two sponsees on at the moment, and that's a consistent thing for me. I they keep me sober because you know in taking them through the steps, it takes me back through them, you know, and uh, keeps me very close. I've never drifted. I've never wanted a drink. Um, I'll wrap up by just saying that um, <clears throat> me and the wife, after the pandemic and the, you know all that, and being in Sweden, and I wasn't working over there, and sort of semi-retired. And uh, my wife, we got a bit on top of each other and uh, we thought we'd have a little break. So that was looming, this option to possibly have a break from each other for a while, see how we go on. Um, and then we were uh, building, extending the house in Sweden as well. So the stars have aligned to the way that the new house is being built in Sweden. I've come away in a motorhome for the last couple of months my wife's out there in a small little area she can live in with a dog little alex and god bless her she's sort of you know overseeing the building work and trying to survive while it's going on up there on her own and uh, it's snowy and cold and wet and everything else and i'm down here in Benidorm. i've gone traveling all around from sweden to copenhagen to germany to france to england back to france down now to uh um Benidorm in Spain and I'm here till next April um, and the reason half the reason for this is I had a terrible accident five months ago I was in Sweden after being in England um, and I went for a sauna and I went outside the sauna and dived into the water and it was a bit shallow and the dive went wrong and I, I hit the bottom and I broke my neck and I broke my back would you believe and in doing that, I was uh, in a bit of a bad way, obviously. And uh, when I got to the hospital, they said, you've fractured your vertebrae, you've broken a bone in your neck, you've ruptured the disc and you've ripped the ligaments in your neck and you've got a stable fracture in your thorax, in your back. I said, Christ, am I, what can we do with that? They said, well, we can operate. We can take out the disc and put in a new one, an implant. We put a plate and screws over the top of that. And that's it. And they did it. And the next day after the operation, I sat up in the bed and I went like this. I went, Jesus Christ, thank you very much. I mean, that was as, it was as quick as that. You know, the, the pain had gone. The neck movement was great. Everything else. So they said, well, you're good to go home now. So I went home that night or the next day, should I say. And uh, I stayed there for three months um, healing. And, uh, and that was nearly three months ago. So when I went back to the hospital, they said to, you know, rest for another well till christmas really and so the building work going on in sweden uh meant i couldn't really be there the fact that i had this accident meant i couldn't help the boys doing the job or really i was a bit in the way there to be truthful you know so it was best that i we decided that instead of going and renting somewhere and having a break from the wife i would um, buy this motorhome do some traveling and see how we go and I'll go back, uh, well, it was meant to be Christmas, but now it's turning in, because it's so cold and wet up there and snowy, motorhomes and that kind of conditions, weather don't really mix. So better to be down here in the nice weather and while I'm healing as well. So uh, I'll go back around April, you know, ready for the spring. A long time away from my wife, first time I've ever been apart this long. But, you know, I met that woman and I love her dearly and we got married and we've been together 20 years. It was my anniversary a few days ago, 17 years married. We've had a great time. She's been such a support for me that I am here if she wants me. You know, the theme on this meeting is kindness, you know, and I was thinking about that today. <laughs> and um, I love my wife enough that if she doesn't want to be with me because it's got, you know, to the point that we've drifted apart, then I'm happy to say, OK, let's shake hands and, you know, we'll just go our different ways. And I'll keep her in my heart and I will start a new life back in england that's as best as i know to explain love for someone else you know i don't want to demand from her or or make her be with me you know she i i, I that's my way of expressing like a kindly you know a, a kind act really is that if she doesn't want to be with me then fair enough but if she does then i'm here to be with her and to improve where i can if i can and be the best guy i can for her so i'm at her disposal really that's what i'm trying to say but i'm very well aware that you know she needs to make a bit of an effort too and if that's not forthcoming then uh, maybe we do call it a day but that's just a very adult grown up way of telling you the truth that if the marriage is to survive we've both got to juggle it up a little bit if it's going to end that's okay too It'll break my heart and I'll shed a tear, but I'll shake her hand because I love that woman and she's done me nothing but good. And I'll wish her all the best in the world and I'll move on. 
<clears throat> and that's to me what AA can do. AA has made me someone who can think, you know, outside of myself, um, be there for other people, you know, walk the walk, not just talk the talk, and help, you know, as I said, help guys where I can. And I, I try and I don't force AA on anybody. I just live my life. If you want what I've got and you want to listen to me talk to you, I'm willing to tell you how the steps, how I went through the 12 steps. I don't change them. I keep that like the holy grail. And them steps for me, you know, they've saved my life and they've given me a life. So I don't adjust them or, or, or tweak them. I leave them just as they are. And I have a little routine that I go through as I went through with Huggy. And I do that with people. And I have had a lot of success. Well, God has had a lot of success because my higher power works through me. You know, and uh, and I, I'm a product of his work, really. You know, I throw myself into AA, and um, I'm a product of this of this fellowship. You know, I love it dearly. I won't have anything, dis, you know, dismissed about it or, or talked, you know, as if you're trying to talk 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 it out of it. I don't stand for none of that. You know, I watch who I knock around with, <clears throat> and um, you know, and, and my life is troubled at the moment, as you can imagine. I'm down here. It's been eight weeks in this bus. It's some great. It's an amazing adventure in one way, but I'm very lonely sometimes too, and missing my wife. So that's obviously the downside of it. But that's so it might be. You know, next year, whatever happens, I will have a hoolie in this motorhome. You know, with her or without her, because then the decision will have been made. But for now, I'm kind of, you know, having to let this time go by. The next four months till April. It's a long time, isn't it? You know, till April before I see her again. And um, and then my life will start then. Either with her going forward or without her, I will rebuild, rebuild possibly back into working back in England in a building thing. I'll set something else up again. You know, with the strength and the help of AA. Um, don't need to drink for all of that though, you know. That's something there, there's a little hopefully there's a message there. You know, through the trials and tribulations in life, throw anything you like at me, but don't throw me a drink. I can't handle that. I can handle anything else, but I can't handle drink. And um, like I said, I made a decision a long time ago when I'd done my step six and seven prayer. I went to the graveyard of my two nieces and their headstone was there with their pictures on them. And I looked at Lena and I looked at Margaret and I amounted to nothing with my life, really. And I had my six month chip. And I buried it down behind the headstone. And I looked up to the heavens. I said the step seven prayer. And I said, God, please remind me that I'm doing this. It's a long life. Please remind me that I've done this and I've offered myself to you. And I never want to drink again. Please, God, let this be true. And I got up from that graveyard and I walked out. It was a sunny day. And I walked down the road. And you know what? I had peace of mind. There was nothing in my head. When I wasn't talking, my head was empty. I went, that's what they talk about. That's what they talk about when they say there's peace of mind. Peace of mind is the prize in AA. You can go through the program, have the obsession removed, and you can attain peace of mind where you are content in your life, that you have a life that you want to be in. Remember earlier, I said I always wanted to be out of it because I never had a life. Now I have a life. I'm enjoying this journey and I want to be in it. Come what may. And God won't abandon me. I know that deep down in my heart. So no matter what, as sad as I may be sometimes at the moment, and also there's a big smile on my face as well. You know, I always try and emanate a happiness around people I meet. Believe me, I'm a fun guy. But um, you know, I don't I feel I feel very protected and and, and quite cozy. And I think that's enough for me tonight. I'm a s I'm I'm a happy, grateful, recovering alcoholic. My name's Angus and I'll leave it there. Thanks, guys. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.